Okay, we are in the book of Judges and chapter 19, and I'm going to do three readings that will give us kind of the sense of the chapter without reading the whole chapter. So I want to read, uh, begin with verses one through four. It says, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the, the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses, and she brought him into her father's house and when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodged there. And then verses 10 through 12, it says, But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem, and there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. And when they were by Jebus, the day after, uh, the day was far spent. And the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn in unto this, this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We'll pass over to Gibeah. And then from verse 22, it says, Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. And the man the master of the house went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house. Uh, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Then I will bring out them, I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you, but unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her lord was, till it was light. And her lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house, and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. So this uh, chapter divides up kind of fairly nicely. Um, we have in verses 1 through uh, 3, uh, the disloyal wife, and then we have in verses 4 through 10, we have a delayed departure uh, because the father-in-law keeps on asking him to stay another night and another night. And then verse 11 through 21, we have a diverted journey. Uh, they, <clears throat> they were, well, was a suggestion was go to Jebus, but no, uh, they wanted to go and be amongst their own people. So they ended up in Gibeah. And then <clears throat> we had from verse 22 to 28, a, a depraved mob and we saw just a terrible event a depraved mob and then verse 29 and 30 a dismembered body and so that's kind of how the chapter divides up <clears throat> and it really is a very grim chapter when god's people become as bad as sodom 
So it begins in, in verse 1. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. Of course, it begins with that uh, refrain that we've become used to as we've gone through the book of Judges. And we, we have stressed and we stress it yet again that that's not suggesting that this is prior to the monarchy and the centralized government. But what it is saying is that they had rejected God as their king and their behavior in the previous chapters seen in idolatry and in these chapters seen in the resultant immorality and it results in them as we know it doesn't say it here but we, the the writer expects you to get the refrain in those days there was no king in israel and every man did that which was right in their own eyes and we're going to see that here uh, even amongst the religious leaders of the nation like this levite uh, there's no king in israel god is not the king of his life and therefore uh, he does that which is right in his own eyes and uh, has a perverted type of morality as we'll see as we go through here and really it's very much like our day today we're living in days where god has his authority has been rejected in our culture and everyone does that which is right in his own eyes. In fact, we hear it. Uh, every person must determine what is right for him personally. Um, and they'll say, what's right uh, for me may not be right for you. Or what's right for you may not be right for me. And, and they'll say there are no absolutes. It's really everybody has to make their own decisions. And <clears throat> of course, uh, you want to ask them in all honestly, are you absolutely sure that there are no absolutes? <laughs> because uh, yeah, they seem to be absolutely sure there's no absolutes, and yet they're, they're saying it with absolute certainty. But clearly, we know that there are, there are absolutes. Uh, there, there is absolutes in, in, in the very laws of nature, and there are absolutes that are seen in the Word of God. So this man, supposed to be a teacher and a leader of the people of Israel. And if you look back for a minute to Deuteronomy 33, and this is why it's so sad, because uh, really we, we saw the Levite leading the way in idolatry uh, in Micah's house, and now we see another Levite and uh, leading the way in, in, in immorality. And so if you notice in Deuteronomy 33, uh, where we, we go through the different tribes. And in verse 8, it says, And of Levi he said, uh, Let thy thummim and thy urim be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, uh, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. And then it goes on and talks about the responsibilities of the tribe of Levi. And uh, we'll notice in verse 9, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They were the faithful ones. When uh, Israel went to whoring, the, the Levites, when the question was asked, who is on the Lord's side? The Levites stood with Moses, uh, even against their own brethren. Yeah, and it says, as a result of that, they shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. So part of the responsibility of the tribe of Levi was to teach J Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. And so wh why this is all so scandalous is that this is a Levite. This is a man who's meant to be a teacher in the nation, teaching them the law, showing them the right way. And yet uh, he is governed really not so much by his loyalty to the word of God, but by the desires of the flesh. And so it tells us that uh, <clears throat> this man, when there's no king in Israel, there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. So he, he takes this, this concubine. Now, these concubines are kind of like a mistress. Uh, they um, often were taken uh, by wealthy men, uh, had no marriage contract, and didn't enjoy the full status of a wife, uh, and yet were 
certainly very commonly taken, sadly, in those days, kind of like a legal mistress. Uh, many prominent men in the Old Testament had concubines, even the best of them. And so I want to go through and just for a minute, at least, just look at how many of these servants of God uh, that we, many of them in Hebrews 11, uh, but they were very involved in what we call concubinage, taking these legal mistresses to themselves. And so we start with the father of the faith, Abraham, in Genesis. Of course, this is where you would expect beginnings to be. And Genesis 25 and verse 6, Genesis 25 and verse 6, we read this, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. Notice plural, so it's several Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And so there's Abraham with his several concubines. Jacob, Genesis 35, and, and verse 22, Genesis 35, verse 22, it says, It came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhar, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. And so, of course, remember uh, the maids uh, of uh, Leah and Rachel became, as it were, Jacob's concubines, not the legal status of wife, but he had children with them. And then we see, uh, and this is perhaps a more surprising one, uh, one of our great heroes, Caleb. And so we notice in First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter two, and verse forty-six, we read this concerning Caleb. And again, a man we appreciate deeply. And Ephah, Caleb's concubine, there Haran and Moza and Gazes, and Haran begat Gazes. And so it's in these list of genealogies. But again, Caleb had. Uh, concubine uh, of course Saul uh, we know he had concubines as well second Samuel we read this second Samuel chapter 3 and verse 7 second Samuel 3 verse 7 and Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah the daughter of Aya and Ishbosheth said to Abner Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? And then <clears throat> David, of course, also uh, chapter 5, verse 13 of Second Samuel. We read this concerning David. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to David. So again, concubines, plural. And what David did, uh, of course, his father Solomon uh, took to the nth degree in Second Chronicles in chapter 11, verse 21. We read this shocking statement, uh, which we're all familiar with, but uh, so you wonder how Solomon managed all this. Kind of remarkable, really. Second Sam uh, Chronicles 11, verse 21. It says, and Rehoboam loved, oh, that's, that's Rehoboam, sorry, First Kings 11, 3 is Solomon. We're looking at Rehoboam. Anyway, we'll read Rehoboam first, then we'll go back to um, verse, and Rehoboam loved Maka, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. For he took 18 wives and three score concubines, 60 concubines, and begat 20 and eight sons and three score daughters. And then back to 1 Kings 11 and verse 3. And that would be Solomon, uh, who we're very familiar with. And it says in 1 Kings 11 and verse 3, he was the wisest man in all the world. But uh, it seems like the wisdom did not come uh, down, filtered down to his relationships. Because it says he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. And so there's the, the grim facts of biblical history. And of course, we, we know that uh, our heroes in the Bible, uh, the, the Lord doesn't 
hide anything from us. It reveals everything about them. It's like the famous painting of Oliver Cromwell. And the artist uh, was about to start and he said, now paint it warts and all. In other words, don't, don't airbrush anything. Do it, do it warts and all. Do it just exactly as it is. And certainly the Bible, uh, as it portrays our heroes, portrays them warts and all. But this was never God's intention. And you, what you'll notice is when they do take these concubines, you don't see it as uh, they all kind of lived happily ever after. It's never uh, this, this multiple wives, concubines. Uh, it, it really never, there's never a good example of how this worked out well. It was always a disaster. And, and there's a reason it wasn't God's original intent. And again, just a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that would, that would indicate that uh, and would indicate that God's plan was one woman, one man together for life. Matthew 19, the Lord Jesus speaking, he answered and said unto them, have you not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And then one more reference, First Timothy and chapter 3, speaking about the... Uh, those that were to be overseers in the local assemblies, uh, that one of the characteristics of an overseer uh, that should stand out about him is the loyalty that this man has to his wife. And First Timothy 3 verse 2 says, not given to wine, sorry, verse 2, uh, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, happy to teach. And so, again, what we see is that this is God's intent. God's intent is clear. And when men veer from God's clear intent in Scripture, it never works out well. And so, again, we see this man, and he takes this concubine. He goes to get her from Bethlehem, Judah, and takes this concubine. But it, it, she wasn't loyal to him. Because I guess he wasn't really loyal to her. I mean, he wasn't willing to make her his wife. He, she was the mistress. And so it says in verse 2, and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there for four months. Now, again, there's some kind of manuscript interesting things here. Some manuscripts say she was angry with him rather than she played the whore. Uh, maybe disgusted by his self-centered behavior. Uh, that's found in the Revised Standard Version, Moffat's, Moffat's translation as well. And they, uh, that the, the, the thinking behind uh, that idea that uh, she was angry with him, uh, they, they would argue, this is their reasoning, these higher critics that come up with this alternative reading, they argue that if she had played the whore against him, the law would have demanded her death. And we get that from Leviticus and chapter 20 and verse 10, Leviticus 20, verse 10, where this is what should happen uh, to somebody uh, who plays the whore. And so it says, and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulterer shall surely be put to death. And so the, the law should demand that a woman like this who has played the whore would be put to death. So they say, well, that's, it can't be that because he goes to get her. And what he should do is go and uh, bring her to be stoned, basically, or put to death. Uh, however, what the higher critics fail to recognize is that in these days when there's no king in Israel, everyone was doing right in their own eyes and they're not fulfilling the law. They're not being obedient to the law. Uh, it, it, in fact, the lawlessness of the time when God's rule was not acknowledged and his word was ignored would fit better this idea that she played the whore and he went after her. Uh, and again, why did he go after her? Again, I suspect that because he was missing the fulfillment of uh, his own lusts with this woman. And so he went to get her again. 
But doesn't it remind you in some ways of the book of Hosea? You remember we said that Hosea is the only book that mentions this incident and refers to the, the shame of Gibeah on several occasions. And in the book of Hosea, we find that Hosea the prophet is told to take a wife of whoredom in order to show God's love for unfaithful Israel. And even after she's committed whoredom, he's told to go and take her back. And again, it shows God's love for his wayward people. But however, we see that this Levite is going after his wayward wife, not because of his deep love for her. In fact, we're going to see uh, that's anything but the truth that he had a deep love for this woman, but he's going to get her primarily motivated by his lust. And so verse uh, three says, and her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly to her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses, she brought him to her father's house. When the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. So he, he had driven back to Bethlehem, Judah, not to bring the judgment of the law to bear upon her, but to speak friendly unto her or literally speak to her heart and to bring her again. He wants to win her back and bring her back again. And the concubine's father rejoiced to meet the Levite. After all, perhaps this seemingly religious man was, uh, was going to help tame uh, his wild flirtatious daughter. And so maybe he was happy that this religious man was coming to get her and maybe this is going to straighten her out and uh, stop her uh, immoral behavior, so to speak, a flirtatious behavior. And so we get in verse four, uh, something of the amazing hospitality that the Middle East is famous for and we see in biblical times. And the reason we get this, this kind of lengthy section of this lavish hospitality is that it's going to be set in contrast. He's kind of set in a contrast here. But when he went to Gibeah, in Gibeah, nobody offered hospitality from Gibeah. It was a stranger that did it. And again, there's something not right in Gibeah when something so basic, so fundamental, like hospitality is neglected. And so it says in verse four, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him and he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodge there. And it came to pass on the fourth day when they arose in the morning that he arose up to depart. And the damsel's father said to his son-in-law, comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread and afterwards go your way. And so exuberant hospitality. Uh, he's trying to go after three days. Oh, stay another day. Come on, come on, just have some more. Uh, and uh, so tremendous exuberant hospitality of the Levite's father-in-law set in contrast for the absolute lack of hospitality that is found in Gibeah. And so it says, <clears throat> verse six, and they sat down and did eat and drink both them together. For the damsel's father said to the man, be content, I pray thee, tarry all night, let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, verse 7, his father-in-law urged him, therefore, and he lodged there again. And so uh, this three days is now getting extended uh, because uh, of this tremendous hospitality. And it's interesting, isn't it, that this Levite has such communion with this father-in-law, but there's no evidence anywhere of him experiencing any communion with God. And that's the kind of tragedy, isn't it? That there's this great communion with the father-in-law uh, and tremendous times they're, they're content to be with him. They're, they're tarrying, they're, they're, as it were, eating and drinking and making merry. And yet there's no communion with God evidenced whatsoever. It almost seems like everything's marvelous here, doesn't it? Uh, he's got reconciliation with his concubine, the father-in-law lavishes hospitality upon him and seems to really like him. Uh, everything, how could it get any better? This seems to be a marvelous scenario. Uh, but as we, we shall see, it doesn't turn out so well. Verse 8, he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until the afternoon and they did eat both of them. So again, 
uh, they're continuing to enjoy this hospitality now on the fifth day. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said to him, Behold, now the day draweth towards evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here that thine heart may be merry. And, and tomorrow get ye early on your way that thou mayest go home. But it says that the man would not tarry that night but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus and so what we see here that as evening shades begin to fall he leaves suddenly in spite of all the requests of his father-in-law to remain another day he goes off the shades of darkness already falling surely it was evening indeed for her for him and for the nation too because evening truly was closing in. The dark night was about to descend that was unparalleled in Israel's history. And so he sets off on his journey and he comes as far as Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there are two asses saddled, the concubine also with him. And there, when they were there, verse 11, by Jebus, the day was far spent and the servant said to his master, come, I pray thee, let us turn in unto the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, we will not turn aside hither unto the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. And so the journey's diverted. Jebus, where <laughs> the uh, would have been the natural place to stop the first city that they came to it means the place trodden down or a threshing place and of course Jebus is Jerusalem and it's an apt description because at this time Jebus was still trodden down of the Gentiles and of course the Lord Jesus said in Luke 21 24 that after they had rejected the Lord Jesus, one of the consequences would be that Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until he would come. And so certainly that's its condition, trodden down of the Gentiles. But tragically, it should have been in Israel's hands. In fact, it would have to wait until David and his day before it would finally come into Israel's hands. And we'll read that in 2 Samuel where David finally takes the city of Jebus or Jerusalem and he takes it and makes it his city. Second uh, Samuel five, verse six, it says, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David saying, except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion the same is the city of David. But what's interesting is that it already had been taken by the tribe of Judah earlier and had been lost. If you look back to Judges, you'll notice in Judges chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, Now the children of Judah had fought against Ju Jerusalem, and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And then if you look down in chapter 1, verse 21, it says the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. And so what had happened is it had been taken, the ground had been taken, but then the enemy had been able to retake the ground and it's good to ask ourselves have we have we personally spiritually lost ground maybe areas where we once had complete victory over the enemy but slowly that that sin that we once knew victory over uh, the enemy as it were has reasserted himself in that area that we once knew victory. And the consequences, of course, in this chapter, for their failure to maintain 
that place of victory over the Jebusites is going to have horrendous consequences. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves the question, are we, gain, are we keeping the ground we've gained or are we losing ground? Are there things that we once enjoyed victory, but now we're, we're back in defeat again? And if not, if, if that's the case, we need to get things right. We need to regain the territory that was lost as David did in his day. And so failure to destroy the enemy hundreds of years before would result in a bad night for Gibeah. Because notice it says that he, he said, we can't lodge there because they're strangers. And so verse 12, his master said to him, we will not turn aside hither to the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We'll pass over to Gibeah. And so <clears throat> not realizing that he might have been better off and better treated in a pagan town than in the place that was inhabited by the people of God. Had he known he was heading for Sodom in the land of Israel, he might have revised his opinion about Jebus and stayed there. He would have been more secure in amongst the strangers of Jebus than he was among the Benjamites of Gibeah. They was they were more corrupt than even he was. And so verse 13, it says, he said to his servant, come, let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. So Gibeah or Ramah, which were, Gibeah was four miles and then Ramah was six miles. So six and a half kilometers or nine and a half kilometers further north than Jebus, respectively, in order to be among his own people. Again, it's, it's late at night, but he makes this, this extra trek to be amongst his own people. It says in verse 14, they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. So they find their way to Gibeah, belonging to Benjamin, and they turned aside thither to go in, and to lodge in Gibeah, and when he went in, he sat him down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house, or to his lodging. And so they found their way, what we would say, to the city square, kind of the prominent place, looking for hospitality, looking for somebody to take them in. And remember, we've already seen, this was something that the that area was renowned, and still to this day is renowned for incredible hospitality. And yet it says no one took them in. And it, again, the so cold had become the, the, the inhabitants of Gibeah that even basic expressions of love and kindness were not seen amongst them. And so no hospitality was seen there. And, you know, it's a tragedy, isn't it? Uh, the people of God are supposed to be renowned for hospitality. Uh, we read in Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And so hospitality ought to be at the heart and center of the belief and behavior of every child of God. We should be those that are known for hospitality. However, the Levite discovered that the inhabitants of Gibeah were so depraved that there was a total absence of brotherly love among them at all. It reflects very poorly on Gibeah because God commanded such hospitality to be seen among his people. And so I want you to just to notice a few references that would indicate how this was, this should have been normal practice amongst the people of God. Look at Leviticus 19, in verse 33 and 34. It says, and if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, you shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. 
So take in the strangers. Remember, you were a stranger in the land of Egypt. Uh, be hospitable. Take in these strangers. Leviticus 25, verse 35. Again, if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen to decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. And so, even in the New Testament, Matthew 25, 35, very, words we're very familiar with, but again, would, would indicate this, this idea of the basics of hospitality. Matthew 25, 35. For I was hunger, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And so hospitality should be a norm. Now, let me just, I'm just being honest with you. Um, twice in the last uh, probably two years, I have been invited to preach at assemblies and <clears throat> driven a considerable distance and spoke and nobody took me out for lunch. Ended up eating lunch in Hardy's on my own. Isn't that staggering? Another occasion, my wife was with me. And I spoke in an assembly. And not one person asked us for lunch. Again, we, we ended up <laughs> in a Burger King or something like that, eating lunch together. And I, I think to myself, where are we at spiritually? If basic brotherly love is not seen amongst us this is why we talk about revival this is why we keep going on and saying that we need revival because it's not the way it should be we're not where we ought to be now there are places where the people of god lavish hospitality upon you and we thank god for that and many places i've been treated like royalty like a member of the royal family and I thank God for that. But but isn't it tragic that there are occasions where it's, or I remember being in an assembly recently and uh, they had a potluck dinner and um, told me to go through the line first and I was sat at the table and not one person came and sat with me. And I was a speaker. <laughs> this is, these things ought not to be, brethren. And so we just need to, again, see this. This is, this is a poor spiritual state when basic hospitality is lacking amongst the people of God. And so we find that he's, he's actually rescued, but he's rescued by a stranger. Uh, it said, verse 16, Behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim. You see, he's not, he's not from Gibeah. He's from Mount Ephraim. He sojourned in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw the wayfaring men in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou? And he said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah. But now I'm going to the house of the Lord. And there is no man that receiveth me to his house. This is the first time the Lord's name is mentioned by the Levite. He, he's never mentioned the Lord at all. And I suspect he's lying through his back teeth because there's no indication at all that he was going to the house of the Lord. But it would have looked good uh, to this man uh, if he realized he's on this pilgrim journey to the house of the Lord rather than just recovering his concubine. And so <clears throat> it's the first time it's mentioned in his lips. Some say, it, again, textually, it should say my house, but again, the, uh, the majority of manuscripts have his going to the house of the Lord. And again, it would indicate what kind of character this is. Uh, he's trying to make things, put a spiritual spin on everything, that he's on this pilgrimage to the house of God, a Levite. And uh, so that's what he says. It gives him acceptability and credibility with the old man. And yet, verse 19 says, yet there is both straw and provender for our asses. There's bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid and for the young man, which is with thy servants. There is no one of anything. So it would seem that the Levite was wealthy uh, because he's got all the provisions with him uh, on his 
on his two beasts and um, he's got everything he needs but the old man said peace be with thee uh, howsoever let all thy wants lie upon me only lodge not in the street now why would he say don't lodge in the street he's really implying this whatever you do you better not spend the night in the city square because obviously this man was well aware of what the city was like what Gibeah had become so whatever you do you don't stay in this street you come and stay with me I've got everything you need uh, let your wants be upon me lodge not in the street so he brought him to his house and gave provender to the asses they washed their feet they did eat and drink now as they were making their hearts merry behold the men of the city certain sons of Belial or worthless sons that's the that word sons of Belial it means they're utterly worthless uh, worthless sons beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house the old man saying bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him and so we see here verse 22 through 24 this we've got this depraved mob and their attempted abuse of the levite himself and the nature of their lust is for a homosexual relationship with the levite right that we may know him it's not that we might just have a cup of tea and get to know the guy uh it it's they they wanted to uh, abuse the man uh physically and so <clears throat> Again, we, we said there's a lot of parallels with Romans chapter 1 here. And, and again, I, I, I've said last time, and I say it again, that I'm more and more convinced that Romans 1 is showing what happens to God's people when they reject the light of the glory of God and uh, the descent that they go into. Verse 27, it says, Likewise also the man, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or fitting such behavior you might expect in a gentile city like sodom and this has got definite echoes of genesis 19 verse 4 and 5 but not in gibeah in israelite city the bible said that homosexuality was not to be allowed in any city of the people of israel if you look at um, the book of deuteronomy chapter 23 it's clearly stated that this and by the way sadly uh today tel aviv is the homosexual capital of the middle east but Deuteronomy 23 states very clearly in verse 17, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And so this is something that should never be seen amongst God's people. It, it, it shouldn't be seen. But remember, they're doing that which is right in their own eyes. Just like today, people do what's right in their own eyes, irrespective of what God says, even though they're, uh, they're suppressing truth and they know it, but nevertheless, they do it. And the problem is God, as our creator, designer, and in his wisdom, he says, I made you. I know how you work individually and as a society. And if you take the path of homosexuality, it will lead to disaster. But the Benjamites thought otherwise. And of course, it's been a problem. And again, sometimes people say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about um, homosexuality. Well, obviously, you know, they're, <clears throat> they're reading it with a blindfold on. You know, the will is the key to the intellect. And if you, if you, if you will something not to be there, you can make it not there in your head, but it's still there. Uh, Leviticus 18, 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. 
Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. First Kings 14. First Kings 14, verse 24. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Part of the reason the Lord was expelling the Canaanites was this kind of behavior. This is why God's judgment was coming on the Canaanites. And now we see God's people doing the same things. Chapter 15 of First Kings and verse 12. And speaking of godly king asa and he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made now just one more passage that we want to talk about in relation to this very distasteful topic but it's one that's in the word of god and we have to deal and not only in the world it's very prevalent in our society so we have to deal with it honestly exodus 16 sorry Ezekiel 16, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 16, and we want to look at verse 49 and 50. It says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and the abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So what we learn from this passage is that it's a sin that is particularly connected with an affluent idol society. Okay. Pride, fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness was in her hand. And so I, not too long ago, met a lady from China. She'd come over to this country um, and she was in a complete shock when she was confronted with homosexuality because she had never, ever heard of it, seen it, or come across it in all her days in China. And when she came to this country, it was like a shock. And actually it was used to drive her to seek morality and through it she found the lord but nevertheless she was in a state of shock but it's it's really a sin connected with an affluent society <laughs> and so clearly uh, a tragic thing when the people of god are involved in things that god has clearly stated to be abominable in his sight and so it says in verse 23, the man, the master of the house, went out unto him and, and said unto them and said to them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house. Do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Then I will bring them, I will bring out now and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you but unto this man do not so vile a thing. Now, again, this is echoes of Sodom, isn't it? Same kind of idea. But isn't it amazing that, um, that this man would give up his daughter, who it seems was a virgin, and the concubine, because when you took somebody under your roof, it was a guarantee of their protection, and it was a very serious thing. And obviously... The laws of hospitality meant more than the laws of chivalry and decency. And it's interesting that these, uh, these men obviously uh, had a very low view of women. And um, certainly uh, the gospel, one of the things the gospel does and always does is it elevates women. It doesn't demean them. It elevates women. But in cultures... Uh, and again, this is God's people. They should have been elevating women, but the, but again, these these are God's people who have lost His authority in their lives, and women are something to be used 
and abused, not something to be loved and cherished and cared for and protected. And so the gospel does indeed have that marvelous effect, but it's certainly uh, in here, you can see this uh, staggering for us to think about giving your daughter, virgin daughter, and say, take, take her, but leave this man alone. Anyway, it says in verse uh, 25 through 28, so now we've, we've seen the attempted abuse of the Levite. Now we're going to see the actual abuse of the concubine. And it says the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine. So again, this Levite, we said he's not Hosea. He, he's not showing God's love to this woman. It's everything about it is self-centered from the start to the finish. He really has no love for this, this woman. Uh, it just was to satiate satiate his lust the men would not hearken him so the man took the concubine and brought her forth unto them and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning and when the day began to spring they let her go and remember why why would they do that all night because because sadly god's people had become the people of the night uh, you know what first thessalonians 5 came immediately to my mind as i was reading this and i was thinking um this is not the way it should be amongst God's people. First uh, Thessalonians 5, verse 5. And that's First Timothy. That's why it looks really strange. First Thessalonians 5, verse 5. It says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, but they shall that be drunken are drunken in the night. And so the night is known, isn't it? The, the time of darkness where, where people go out and do wickedly. And yet here are the people of God. And as soon as daylight comes, they disappear. But all night long, they've been abusing this woman. They've become people of the night, people of darkness. Romans 3.18 would be an apt description of these people. The Benjamites, the people of Gibeah, in Romans 3 verse 18 simply says this, there's no fear of God before their eyes. This is God's people, but he has no authority over them. They're the ultimate authority, and the fear of God has gone from their eyes and so they abused this poor woman. And it would be classed as a gang rape. Uh, and rape was worthy of the penalty of death. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 25. That's what should have been uh, executed on these individuals. And notice verse 26. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. Behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. Kind of, it's amazing, isn't it, to, to think, it seems like while this man put his concubine out, he went to bed and slept. I mean, he must have known what would happen to her, this depraved mob. And yet it, it tells us that um, the man, um, it says, uh, her Lord rose up in the morning, verse 27. So it seems like he had a good night's sleep. No conscience whatsoever. I mean, how could you sleep knowing what was going on out there? Uh, how could you get a wink? But it, he seems like he had a good night's sleep, and then he got up. And, and here's this woman. And notice her pose. It, it talks about her hands on the threshold and it's like she's reaching out for acceptance and protection from those within the house in her hour of need but there was no hope of that from these unprincipled men and she died there a lonely abused and broken woman and yet what does he do he said to her, verse 28, up, let us be going. <laughs> let's get on the horse. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Get on the mule. And when she failed to obey his harsh command, 
he realized she was dead. It was bad enough that his concubine uh, had been tossed to these perverts of Gibeah to be abused all night long. But the next day, he just barks at her and says, get up, let's go. You can see this guy's all heart, can't you? I mean, he, <laughs> he, he's really a, a very compassionate man. Uh, what, what a terrible thing. And then it leads us to the end, and we, we've got to quickly wrap up here. A dismembered body. He, it says, and of course, priests and Levites were used to dividing the sacrificial animal into pieces. He's, he's used to this. He, he knows how to do this. So he comes to his house. He took a knife, laid hold on his concubine, divided her together with her bones to 12 pieces and sent her to all the coasts of Israel. Unusual postal service. I don't know how he managed to, to enact this, but sent to all the tribes of Israel, dividing her up like he was dividing up a sacrifice for the altar and sends it to the 12 tribes of Israel. And their response when they get this is obviously they're shocked. Not only what they received, but perhaps along with it went the message of what had happened that night. But of course, what had happened that night, there'd be no, no mention of his negligence or his part in it. He would come out smelling of roses, but, but this is what happened. And so it says, verse 30, well, I saw that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from that, that day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, speak your minds. And obviously he's looking for vengeance on the, Gibe the, the men of Gibeah. And so he knows how to, as it were, tug the heartstrings of the children of Israel by sending the parts of this woman's body to the 12 tribes. But it's, again, what a horrendous chapter. And doesn't it show you what happens when people turn their hearts away from God, when he is no longer in authority and everyone does that which is right in their own eyes? This is what society looks like. And it's not unlike our society today. And the only hope for our society is the gospel of the grace of God, which will get men once again to fear God and honor him like he's worthy of. And God uh, help us as we consider these things and that just ask ourselves the question, have we lost ground ourselves? is the ground we need to take back that has been given to the enemy. May God encourage us. Amen.